Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas, Professor of Philosophy at Providence College. This is a five-part lecture based on Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. The five parts of the lecture are four main parts, with one part having two parts. Uh, a prologue, uh, Yali's question, which I covered in lecture one of this series. This lecture will be part two, uh, discussing uh, From Eden to Cajamarca. Uh, the next lecture will be two parts on food production. And then finally, we will end our discussion on From Luck to Germs in Steel. Again, this is the second part of this lecture series, and we are discussing uh, human evolution from Eden to Cajamarca. We begin with what Diamond calls a natural history experiment. I find the term a little demeaning, but we are talking about uh, natural history and what we can learn from it. And so uh, we will proceed without the term experiment in it. Uh, and this is a discussion of the Moriori and the Maori of uh, Polynesia. Uh, Polynesian society uh, was a vast society uh, and the Moriori were a part of that. They migrated from New Zealand to the Chatham Islands. Uh, it's unclear why they migrated, although uh, legend says that the gods told them to do so. Uh, it is possible that uh, they wanted to turn away from the uh, violence uh, that they experienced uh, on New Zealand. Uh, but for whatever reason, there was a migration of a group of people, the Moriori, uh, from New Zealand to the Chatham Islands. Uh, and originally, the Moriori were cannibals, they were warlike, and they were farmers like other people in the Polynesian uh, societies. The Chatham Islands, however, uh, presented a much different environment than they were used to. It was a harsher environment where they could not grow their traditional foods. Uh, so the soil was colder. They couldn't grow the tomatoes, uh, potatoes they were used to growing. Uh, local foods were low in protein and hard to gather, and so they returned uh, to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And so uh, Diamond wants to consider the Moriori because they turned from a uh, farming lifestyle to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Uh, but the other interesting fact about the uh, Moriori is that they also turned away from their uh, violent ways uh, to become a pacifist society. And they followed what is called a Nunuku's law, which is th that they should not kill others. So I mentioned that they evolved from a, a society in which they were cannibals, uh, very violent, warlike. And the legend is that Nunuku was a king who stood up between two warring factions and said, peace, we should not kill each other anymore. And those who kill would be cursed that their bodies, uh, their bellies would rot out. Uh, this is an important part of the Moriori society uh, on Chatham Island and uh, plays a role in how they came to be dominated uh, by the Maori and also uh, almost uh, extinct from the world. Now, the Moriori uh, had encounters with a variety of people. Uh, we're not quite sure when they landed on the Chatham Islands. It was sometime between 1000 and 1600 AD. Uh, so they could have been there for uh, 700 years before they found other people, or it could have only been 200 years. Uh, but what we do know is that they did not know of other people uh, before 1791. They did not have an, a word for other people, uh, and their world was very limited. But in 1791, the uh, HMS Chatham, from which the islands received its name, uh, landed uh, by a fluke of luck, a storm, uh, on the islands. Uh, there was an encounter between the uh, British and the Moriori. Uh, the Moriori uh, were trying to be peaceful. Of course, because they were committed to this peaceful lifestyle, the uh, British uh, on the uh, HMS Chatham either misunderstood or had violent tendencies. And the result 
uh, between this incident was that one Moriori was dead. Uh, that's one result. Uh, the English left the island, but they noted it, and so others followed after them. Uh, the Moriori themselves blamed themselves for the death, uh, and they left the body of the person on the beach uh, for his belly to rot out. Of course, as with any uh, encounter with Europeans, uh, disease spread among the uh, Moriori, and so they lost 10% of their population. So uh, uh, 2,000 people went down to 1,800 people. Uh, but the more important point is that later expeditions uh, of British and other peoples uh, hunted seals on the island and in the area. This was a main food source for the Moriori. Uh, it was also a source of clothing uh, and fuel. And this drove the seals away from the island so that the Moriori uh, soon didn't even have uh, the requisite food that they were used to eating. In 1835, the Maori traveled from New Zealand uh, to the island. They decided that they were going to occupy the island. Uh, whether they knew people were there or not was unclear from the history. Uh, when they encountered the Maori, uh, they killed, cannibalized, and enslaved those they found. The Maori did have a discussion about uh, how they should interact with the Maori, whether they should lay down their arm, or whether they should allow this violence to happen to them. Some of the younger uh, men argued that they should not, that their law against violence was only for the Moriori, uh, but the elder chieftains said that they must instead honor Nunuku's law and not kill others. Uh, so uh, many of the Moriori uh, who, well, they were all killed or uh, enslaved, uh, and those who were killed were often cannibalized. Now, the interesting factors here for Diamond is that the Moriori and the Maori are both from the same Polynesian culture. They both began as, uh, as farmers, agriculturalists, uh, but the Moriori returned to a hunter-gathering lifestyle. And the reason is that they could not grow their traditional Polynesian crops on the island uh, in the colder climate. Uh, also, uh, the, more, the Maori were able to support non-farming craftspeople. They had a denser population. So some 500 Maori traveled from New Zealand. This left many Maori back in New Zealand, but these 500 traveled from New Zealand and were able to take over the Chatham Islands. Uh, they had denser populations. They were used to ferocious wars. Uh, they had a, a chieftain and a political organization. Uh, and uh, they had weapons from the Europeans. So they had already uh, been fighting the Europeans. They were one of the fiercest resistors to English colonization. Uh, they lasted against the English much longer. So they had uh, guns uh, and various other steel weapons that the Maori uh, would not have had, uh, even if they had put up resistance. The Maori uh, were non-hunters. Non uh, they, I'm sorry, they were, they did not have non-hunter craftspeople because they had such a low population. Uh, they were peaceful and their political organization was democratic. And so various differences from a common ancestry. And uh, what we see here is that it was weapons gained from the Europeans as well as a denser population and uh, the use of ferocious war that led to the Maori overtaking the Moriori. So Diamond concludes that Polynesian island societies differ greatly in their economic specialization, social complexity, political organization, and material products related to differences in population size and density, which was related in turn to differences in island area, fragmentation, and isolation. It was not racial differences that led uh, to uh, the conquering of the Maori. Now, uh, what we know to put this in context about peopling the world is that uh, the world uh, expand the human population expanded out of uh, Africa and settled in various areas. Uh, Australia and New Guinea required watercraft that was not available for another thirty thousand years and developed in the Mediterranean area. 
Uh, how they had that watercraft is unclear. Uh, people did migrate to a cold European area in which sewing was developed, and they eventually migrated to the Americas with the oldest uh, evidence around 12,000 BC. Regarding the Americas, there is a uh, rather fierce debate uh, over when uh, the first peoples came to America. The traditional understanding is the uh, Clovis uh, explanation of American settling. Uh, this is named after a spear point uh, found throughout the archaic Americas, uh, but uh, originally found at Clovis Point. Uh, it also coincides with a extinction of large mammals, uh, including horses uh, from uh, the Americas. Uh, and it also involves uh, the traditional understanding that uh, these people crossed the Bering Strait uh, and proceeded south and east so that uh, Canada, uh, places in today's Canada would have been uh, occupied before places in South America and places on the West Coast would have been occupied before places on the East Coast. However, some evidence suggests that there is uh, there are pre-Clovis claims uh, to settling America, some dating back as far as 15,000 years ago, rather than the 10,000 years associated with Clovis Point. Uh, here, people would have uh, uh, traveled from uh, Asia to the Americas via ocean rather than via the Bering Strait. Uh, we've recognized various uh, places with uh, human remains that seem to date back to 16,000 years, uh, yet it's hard to prove that these are pre-Clovis existences rather than uh, that they uh, are somehow Clovis existences mixed up with other historical data. Now, to put that in context, uh, history up until 11,000 BC was uh, really a hunter-gatherer situation, and we only began to get settled villages around 11,000 BC at the end of the Pleistocene Age uh, with the end of the last Ice Age and with the presumed peopling of Americas. Now, the consequences of this is that if uh, someone traveled back in time to this period to 11,000 BC and observed all the peoples of the world, they would not be able to tell who would later be able to conquer the world because at the time, every group seemed to have its own advantages and disadvantages. And yet what we see in history, of course, is that a certain group of people came to have the advantage. Diamond jumps forward to the encounter of the Spanish uh, with uh, the uh, Aztecs, I'm sorry, the Incas uh, at Cajamarca in 1532. And the Spaniards were able, with a very small force, to capture uh, the emperor of the uh, Incas and hold him for ransom and then back uh, renege on their deal and kill not only the emperor, but most of the warriors there. Uh, Diamond says that uh, Pizarro was able to capture the emperor Atahualpa uh, because he had steel and horses, and he happened to come to Cajamarca because Europeans had developed maritime travel and a government organization to support that maritime travel. Atahualpa uh, was at Cajamarca because he uh, had recently won a civil war that resulted from the original uh, introduction of smallpox to the Americas by uh, the Spanish. And so smallpox led to the death of the old emperor, a civil war resulted, and Atahualpa uh, came to be uh, in this place because he'd won this war. But he didn't realize that he was walking into a trap because he didn't have the kinds of stories that the Spanish had of betrayals and of strategy. Uh, because they simply hadn't developed that yet. So this leaves us with the question, why did all those advantages come to lie with the Europeans rather than with the New World? And so that's something that we will explore in the next three uh, lectures.